CD1. IELTS, for academic purposes. A short intensive course by Malcolm Mann and Steve Taylor Knowles. Published by McGraw-Hill 2009. All rights reserved. Placement test. Listening. Section 1. You'll hear two teachers discussing a school trip. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Oh, there you are, Paul. Do you have a few minutes? Can we think about this year's school trip? Hi, Jean. Yes, of course. Have you got any ideas? I've been looking through some information, and I've brought a few leaflets with me. Here you are. Okay, thanks. Just remind me when the trip is. Next Friday. We'll be leaving at 9 and be back here at around 4, so we've probably got time to visit a couple of places. Let's see. What leaflet have you got there? Central Gardens. Looks like a nice place. It's open from 9 until 6, so we could go there any time we wanted, really. What about there in the morning and then somewhere else in the afternoon? Farmer's Market would be an option first as well, at least until they close at 1. Or we could try Grey Castle. That should be possible in the morning or in the afternoon. Oh, hang on. That's at the weekend. The last admission is at noon on weekdays. Greenhall says the same thing. Queen's Park opens at 8, so we could go there first. Or, according to these times, we could go there on the way back to school. Because they don't close the gates until sunset during the week. Okay, that gives us a few options. We went to Queen's Park a couple of years ago, didn't we? I seem to remember that the pupils really enjoyed it. It'd be nice to go somewhere new as well. I've seen groups from other schools going around Grey Castle. So have I. But then again, maybe we should play it safe and go to Green Hall. At least we've got experience of taking classes around there. Farmer's Market is popular with other schools, though, so it must be interesting. It'd be good to go somewhere where someone can show the pupils around, you know, explain things to them. I've been on a tour around the castle, and they do a really good job. I think they have guides at the hall, too, don't they? It says here that they used to, but don't anymore. You can get shown around Central Gardens, though. I think we'd have to do any explaining if we took the pupils to the market or the park. That wouldn't be a problem, though. No, and at least those two would be free, wouldn't they? I think all the others charge, and we'd have to get the parents to pay some money. I'm sure they wouldn't mind paying if it was a small amount. Let me check the leaflets. There's a special price for large groups at Grey Castle. Oh, but you can get into Central Gardens for nothing. Right. Oh, I've just thought of something. We wouldn't need to book anything if we were going to Queen's Park. But what about the other places? Uh, Central Gardens say you need to let them know if there are more than 10 people in your group, which would include us. The same at Grey Castle. Farmer's Market says you can just turn up. And so does Green Hall. Right. Well, I suggest we take the pupils to Grey Castle for a tour in the morning. How does that sound? Yes, sounds good. We should contact them to book it as soon as possible. In the afternoon, we can do something a bit more relaxed at the park, and we'll have to think about going to Green Hall another year. Shame Farmer's Market isn't open, but we can't change the day. So that's a decision then. Now, let's think about what we're going to get the pupils to do. It's a school trip, after all, and we should give them some work to do. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. I think they should know something about the place before they go. That way they know what they're looking at and they'll be able to write about it better when they get back. I'll put some information together to look at at home and give them copies after the next lesson. Good idea. I'll write something for them to do as they're going round the place. We did a quiz last year and that worked really well. I'll do the same kind of thing this time. Okay. Now, what about the travel arrangements? How are we getting there? What do you think? I remember one year Mrs. Jackson took her group by bus, and that was a complete nightmare. Hmm. It's quite a long way, isn't it? We could hire a coach for the day, which is what we usually do. Or there's the train. It's rush hour, though, isn't it? So it'll be really crowded. And it'll be more convenient for the rest of the day if we've got our own transport. Yes, we'll do that then. Anything else? Oh, we need to let the parents know what's happening. We could ask the office to call everyone. It would take too long with so many. I know when we send a letter home, there are always a few pupils who lose it. But not all the parents have email yet, so I don't think we have any choice, really. I'll write something and take it to the school office this afternoon. Right. I'll go and tell the pupils the good news. Placement test. Listening. Section 2. You'll hear a lecturer talking about the International English Language Teaching System, IELTS. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 20. Remember to write no more than two words or a number for each answer. Hello everyone. Now, the International English Language Testing System exam, or IELTS as it's better known, is one of the most successful and popular English language exams in the world today. What we're going to look at now is the history of IELTS and how it came to be so successful. The story starts back in the 1960s when the British Council created an exam called EPTB to test international applicants wanting to study at universities and colleges in the UK. EPTB, by the way, stood for English Proficiency Test Battery. Strange name, I know. This exam mainly used multiple choice questions and by the end of the 1970s was considered a little old-fashioned. So, in 1980, it was replaced by ELTS, the English Language Testing Service. This new exam was much more modern in approach. It was much more communicative, for example, and was intended to reflect how language was used in the real world, particularly in the academic context of universities and colleges. However, during the 1980s, the number of candidates taking the test was quite low. For example, only 4,000 people took the test in 1981. It's true that this had risen to 10,000 by 1985, but if you compare that to the number of candidates who take IELTS each year these days, more than a million, you can see why they considered it to be quite small. There were also some practical problems with the test, so, in 1987, it was decided to conduct a review, leading to a revised version of the exam. This was introduced in 1989, under its new name, IELTS. Over the next few years, the number of candidates increased rapidly. In 1995, there were over 43,000 candidates, and it was possible to take the test in any one of 210 test centres around the world. 1995 was also the year of the next revision to the exam, which simplified the reading module and also improved exam administration. Further minor changes followed. The speaking module was altered in 2001 and the criteria for marking the writing tasks were revised in 2005. 
In the same year, a computerised version of the exam was offered at certain test centres. 2003 was a milestone for IELTS, as it was the year when the number of candidates went over half a million for the first time. There's no doubt that today, with, as we said, a candidature more than double what it was back in 2003, IELTS is a major player in the highly competitive industry of English language examinations. Unit 1. Listening B. Here at last. Sorry I'm late. That's okay. I was beginning to get worried. I thought you might have had an accident or something. No, no, nothing like that. I just lost my way around town. I haven't been to this cafe before. Still, I found it in the end. Anyway, how are you? Fine. Actually, I'm a little tired. I spent all morning at the Exhibition of Contemporary Art. Oh, yes. Was that at the Johnson Gallery? I heard about that. How was it? Well, there were some great pictures. They had oil paintings from lots of different artists. I thought it was badly planned, though, to be honest. Sometimes I didn't know what painting I was looking at. I had to search through the catalog to find them. I might try to see it next week. Yes, you should. Unit 1. Listening D. Maybe I'll go and see the exhibition this weekend. Anyway, tell me about this photography course you've started. How's that going? Oh, yes. Well, it's going really well. I've had three lessons so far, and I get on well with the other students. What about the teacher? Mr. Waterhouse? He's a nice guy, and he really knows what he's doing. He gives us an assignment each week, and then he takes a look at the photographs we've taken. The only problem is that some of his explanations can be a bit confusing. And it's not just me, because one or two of the other students have said the same thing. It's interesting, though. Is that your camera? Have you taken any photos today? Yes, one or two. I'll show you on the camera. Let me see. I quite like this one. And these two. They're great. I really like them, especially these ones of the sky. They're really dramatic with all the clouds and black and white like that. What are you going to do with them? Well, I'll use them for my course. We have to display the work we've done all year, and then there's the exam in July, of course. At least it'll be nice and warm then. Yes, I've had enough of this cold weather. Oh, look at the time. I have to go, I'm afraid. When shall we get together again? I'm busy next week because I'm going on holiday in a fortnight. Lucky you. Yeah. We can meet before then, though. Let's say in ten days' time. Sure. Let's meet here again. And don't get lost next time. Bye. Unit 1. Speaking A. Do you have any hobbies? No. I not have time for hobbies. You understand? What different types of entertainment are available where you live? Actually, I'm very lucky. I live in an area with loads of things to do. There's a big cinema complex just down the road from where I live, and there are several theaters and venues for concerts nearby. There are also a lot of restaurants. The only thing we don't have that I'd really like is an ice rink. I love ice skating. When you go out for an evening, what do you like to do? I, well, uh, I, when I go out for an evening, I like to go out with my friends and do something, uh, well, something, uh, uh, enjoyable. Are there any kinds of entertainment you don't like? Well... I'm not very keen on watching sport, to be honest. I quite like playing basketball or tennis, you know, but the idea of going to watch a football match, well, it's just not for me. Unit 1. Pronunciation 1. I suspect the main character will be a suspect. 2. 
What means of transport will they use to transport the paintings? 3. When you extract some words from a text, you have an extract. 4. Shall I keep a record? We need to record all the results. Unit 1. Exam practice. Listening. You'll hear a woman calling Laverton Arts Centre for some information. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Laverton Arts Centre, how can I help you? Hello. I've been to the Arts Centre a few times recently and I understand you have this scheme for regular visitors. The Friends of Laverton Arts Centre. Yes, that's right. I wonder if you could tell me a little about it. I mean, how much it costs and what benefits it offers, things like that. Certainly. Well, first of all, the good news is that we've recently changed the scheme. It used to cost £15 a year, but now it's free. All you have to do is fill in an application form. You can either come to the Arts Centre and do that here, or you can go to our website and apply online. And so what are the benefits of joining? There are actually quite a few. As a friend of Laberton Arts Centre, you'll receive a newsletter every three months with information on all the forthcoming events. That sounds useful. You also get priority booking for shows and concerts in the main theatre. Can you explain how that works exactly? Yes. What that means is that when tickets go on sale, for the first two days they're only available to Friends of the Arts Centre. So as long as you book early, you can make sure you get seats. Great! Do you ever offer discounts to Friends of the Centre? Under the old system, when you had to pay to be a member, we did. Under the new system, there won't be any discounts for shows in the main theatre or films at the art cinema. Having said that, we will be offering some discounts to members for performances in the small theatre. There'll be information about this in each issue of the newsletter. I suppose I can find that information online as well, can I? Absolutely. Actually, we're redoing our website at the moment. Right now, there actually isn't a special section for Friends of the Arts Centre on the website. Once the site's been redesigned, there will be. You'll be able to put in your username and password and enter a special section just for you. It sounds excellent. Are there any requirements, though? I mean, as a member, do I have to do anything? Yes, sorry, I forgot to mention that. There are no formal requirements at all. Though, obviously, we have this scheme to encourage people to attend events here regularly. So, we ask that you attend at least four events a year, whatever they are, if you possibly can. Nobody's going to count, though, and it's totally up to you. That sounds fair enough. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. While you're here, we're actually conducting a short survey of people who phone up the Arts Centre. Would you mind if I asked you a few questions? It'll only take a couple of minutes. Sure, no problem. Thanks a lot. So, how many times have you visited Laverton Arts Centre in the last six months? Well, I've only lived in the area for the last four months, so not that many times. Um, three, I suppose. Yes, that's right. Fine. And how did you first find out about the Arts Centre? Let me think. Oh, yes, a friend invited me to a concert and I came with her. Have you ever seen a film at the Arts Cinema here? No, I haven't, to be honest. In fact, 
Until you mentioned it earlier, I didn't realise you even had a cinema. One more question. If we offered a free tour of the art centre, including things such as going backstage to look at the dressing rooms, would you be interested in going on it? Oh, yes, definitely. I think a tour like that would be very interesting. I'd even pay for it. That's great. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Unit 2. Listening B. OK. I'd like to welcome you all to the Overseas Student Welfare Service and just give you some idea of what we offer and how you can get involved. It's great to see that so many of you have turned up today to offer your help. I know that many of you are overseas students yourselves and I'm sure you'll find it a very satisfying experience. The service has been going for 10 years now, although of course the university has always offered help to students from both inside and outside the UK. With increasing numbers of students arriving from outside the EU though, we decided that it was important to have a specific service to cater for their needs. Now, what is the service all about and what do we do? Well, it's important to remember that we give some practical help, such as providing small amounts of money, but our main function is to provide advice. Students come to us with their problems and hopefully our advice helps them to deal with the situation. You have to remember that many people who come here as students don't know much about UK law, which can be very different from the situation in their own country. Don't worry if you yourself don't know much about it right now, because of course we will train you if you decide to volunteer for the service. We will make sure you understand how UK law affects overseas students, particularly in the area of accommodation, which is probably the single biggest issue facing the people who come to us for help. Unit 2. Listening D and E. For many of the people who come to us for help, this is the first time they've lived away from home. It's a very big change to leave not only home, but your home country. And they often feel lost, confused and lonely. We call this culture shock and it's a real problem. I'm sure some of you have similar experiences. You'll get the chance to discuss those in groups later. Of course, all of the overseas students who attend the university have good English skills, so there isn't usually a language problem. However, it can still be hard for students who come from outside the EU to make friends. They don't know the customs and are often very shy about approaching people because they're afraid of appearing rude. One of the functions of the Overseas Student Welfare Service is to help those people fit in. Finally, I'd like to tell you what working for the service involves. The service runs from 9am to 7pm every day, except Wednesday and Sunday, and you'll be expected to work for three hours once a month. Of course you can do more if you wish, but that's the minimum we ask you to do. Before you start, though, we need to train you. That all takes place at the weekend, so you don't need to worry about missing any lectures. Now, does anyone have any questions? Unit 2. Speaking B. First of all, I believe the area where I live is a fairly typical residential area. I think it's becoming a more desirable place to live because the cost of housing is going up all the time. Apparently, house prices have doubled in the last five years, so it's becoming quite an expensive place to live. There are a few shops, but I agree with the local mayor when he says that we need to build more places for children to play. As far as I'm concerned, the most enjoyable aspect of living around here is that the people are very friendly. If you need someone to keep an eye on your place while you're away on holiday, for instance, or you need someone to help look after the children, there always seems to be a neighbor who's happy to help. Unit 2. Pronunciation. As far as I'm concerned, young people in this area get blamed for too many things. 
From my point of view, the area needs more police officers on the streets. In my opinion, local people don't do enough to help themselves. It seems to me that there's a real problem with unemployment in this area. I tend to think that crime isn't such a big problem as a lot of people think it is. My personal opinion is that people in this area are very friendly. Unit 2. Exam practice. Listening. You'll hear a woman talking on the radio about sport aid. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Hello, you're listening to Redgate Radio and I'm Alex Dunbar. As you may know, people in the city will be taking part in Sport Aid this weekend. Here's Liz to tell us more about this event and how you can get involved. Thanks, Alex. Well, this is the fourth year of Sport Aid, and it looks like it's going to be bigger and better than ever. Sport Aid is organised by the City Council, and it supports a number of different charities, although the main reason for its existence is to raise money to help developing countries. Last year, it raised over £100,000, and that money has helped to make life a little easier for people in many parts of the world. Just to give you one example, the village of Otunga in Chad now has a water supply, meaning that the people no longer have to walk miles every day just to get water. And there are countless stories like that. By contributing to the infrastructure of different regions, it's hoped that things like sport aid will enable many more people to climb out of poverty. Another way in which that happens is by giving people the knowledge and skills to earn money. One of the biggest issues facing people in many poorer areas of the world is education. Something that we take so much for granted can be rare and expensive in some regions. Education is seen as key to development and money from sport aid has paid for schoolrooms and equipment in a number of places. So what can you do to help? There are lots of ways in which you can get involved. First of all, you can go down to the biggest attraction of the day, the Sport Aid Charity Football Match. There will be thousands of people at City Stadium and all the money raised from the sale of tickets goes to charity. There's much more going on than just a football match, of course. There will also be lots of entertainment for the whole family, including a fair, stalls selling all kinds of food and even a chance to try out some sports you may not have tried before, like softball and volleyball. It's probably going to be a very active day, so it's best to make sure that everyone is in comfortable clothes before you go down there. It's always a fantastic day out, and it's a great way to show your support. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. But you're not restricted to being a spectator. Apart from the main event, there are a large number of smaller events taking place across the city. These range from fun runs around the park to games of cricket, and there's sure to be something happening in your area. Contact details are available for the people putting together each event, and you can get those from the council website. We'll be giving you the address for that at the end of the program. It's still not too late to organise your own event, as lots of people around the city are, although you'll have to get going on it now. First of all, do check that there isn't a similar event in your area, and then call the town hall to register your event. The local council needs to approve all events, and you'll stand more chance if you can come up with a sport that's new to some people, rather than just another game of football. Use your imagination or try the internet to get some ideas.
try to come up with something that's going to get lots of people along and which will raise money. You might not want to go for anything that turns out to be too costly, though, since the council isn't able to supply bats or balls or anything else you need. But they will give you advice on finding a good location and might even be able to help you out with small prizes for winners, as well as making sure that everyone knows about your event by publicising it on the website and sending you an organisers pack with lots more information. There are a couple more things you need to be aware of for your event. There aren't any age restrictions. Although, if you're under 18, you'll need to get an adult, such as a parent, to sign the forms for you and to handle any money raised. But you do need to live in the Red Gate area. You should also be prepared for anyone to turn up, since all events are public. Unit 3. Listening B. The Tutor. Now, of course, our sun is just one star out of billions in the Milky Way. We don't know exactly how many stars there are, but current estimates put it somewhere between 200 and 400 billion. Jenny. I think I'm right in saying most astrophysicists now think the Milky Way came into existence as a galaxy somewhere between 6.5 and 10.1 billion years ago. That's right, isn't it? Ahmed. One thing that amazed me was how old the oldest star in the Milky Way is. I mean, I knew our sun was quite young, being formed about 4.6 billion years ago. But to think that the oldest star in the Milky Way was created about 13.2 billion years ago, even before the Milky Way itself, well, that's incredible. Unit 3. Listening C. Right, shall we start? So, I asked you for this week's seminar to do some research into what we think is going to happen to the Milky Way in the future. Before we do that, let's just remind ourselves about some key facts about the Milky Way. Jenny, how old is our galaxy? I think I'm right in saying most astrophysicists now think the Milky Way came into existence as a galaxy somewhere between 6.5 and 10.1 billion years ago. That's right, isn't it? Indeed it is. Good. Ahmed, does that mean all the stars in the Milky Way are younger than that? No, it doesn't. One thing that amazed me was how old the oldest star in the Milky Way is. I mean, I knew our sun was quite young, being formed about 4.6 billion years ago. But to think that the oldest star in the Milky Way was created about 13.2 billion years ago, even before the Milky Way itself, well, that's incredible. You have to understand that the Milky Way was initially formed by things such as stars already in existence. So actually, it's hardly surprising that some stars in the galaxy are older than the galaxy itself. But you're right, it is very old. Now, of course, our sun is just one star out of billions in the Milky Way. We don't know exactly how many stars there are, but current estimates put it somewhere between 200 and 400 billion. But let's just think for a minute about our solar system in relation to the Milky Way. Jenny. Well, just as the Earth goes round the Sun, our solar system goes round the center of the Milky Way. It takes quite a long time to go all the way round, though, approximately 225 to 250 million years to complete one revolution or orbit. Very good. And what is each revolution around the Milky Way called? Ahmed? A galactic year. And what else do we know about galactic years? Well, they're also called cosmic years. As Jenny said, they last about 250 million years, and we think there have been somewhere between 20 and 25 of them since the formation of the Sun. Yes, and to put that in some perspective, since humans first appeared on Earth, we've only had about 0.0008 of one galactic year. Unit 3. Listening D. 
let's come on to what's going to be quite a large event in the future of the Milky Way. Jenny, what's Andromeda? Well, Andromeda is a spiral galaxy like the Milky Way. It's about two and a half million light years away, which makes it the Milky Way's nearest neighbor. In fact, you can just see it with the naked eye on a clear night. But I suppose the most important thing about Andromeda is that it's moving towards the Milky Way at a rate of 120 kilometers per second. And the theory is that Andromeda and the Milky Way will collide together in somewhere between three and six billion years from now. Absolutely. Now, I do want to emphasize that some astrophysicists do disagree about the numbers. Some say that the two galaxies will start merging in only a couple of billion years, and we're still not 100% sure that the galaxies will hit each other. But let's go with our best guess for now, which is that in several billion years, Andromeda and the Milky Way are going to collide. Before that, of course, as Andromeda gets closer, it'll become brighter and clearer in the Earth's night sky. Ahmed, tell us what's likely to happen between now and the collision. Well, as you said, in about three billion years, the stars and gases of Andromeda will become even more visible to the naked eye here on Earth. But, of course, it's highly unlikely there will be any humans on Earth to witness it as the sun's hotting up. In one or two billion years, radiation from the sun will almost certainly have made the Earth totally uninhabitable and lifeless. But let's say we do witness it somehow. What will we see? Well, we probably won't see many stars smashing into each other because the distance between stars is so great. It's quite possible for two galaxies, both with billions and billions of stars, to merge together without a single star hitting another star. Amazing, really, when you think about it. Unit 3. Speaking A. Candidate 1. Well, I'm now 20. Over the next 60 years, let's say, we're going to see enormous changes because of global warming. The climate's going to change and the sea level's going to rise, so there may be some cities now, like maybe New York, that will be underwater. And other places that are really cold now, like Siberia in Russia, may become much warmer, so more people will choose to live there. Candidate 2. I'm quite optimistic. I think people here will have a better health system, and so will live longer. And I think the education system will improve too, meaning people will get better qualifications and better jobs. It's possible that I'm wrong, but I'm actually looking forward to the next two decades. We'll see what happens. Candidate 3. Well, it's impossible to know for sure, of course, but I think that in the year 3000 or so, people won't just live on Earth. We'll also be living on other planets. At least, I hope so. But to come back to your question, unfortunately, I think by then a lot of animal and plant life here on Earth will have become extinct. Candidate 4. That's an interesting question. I'd say that... Over the next 10 or 20 years or so, we'll see the technology that we've already got, you know, computers, mobile phones, that kind of thing, get much faster and more powerful and cheaper. But I think it's highly unlikely we'll have things like personal flying cars or robots doing the housework at home. Unit 3, Pronunciation. 1. I haven't read my horoscope yet, but I'll read it in a minute. 2. When are they going to present the leaving present? 3. Are you content with the content of the article? 4. I hope I'll be performing live for as long as I live. 5. We'll look at these minute particles through a microscope in a minute. 6. When the clown takes a bow, his bow tie will fall off. Unit 3. 
Exam practice. Listening. You'll hear a tutor and two students discussing modern European writers. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Okay, so to continue our look at modern European writers who have focused on the future in their work, today we're talking about H. G. Wells. Last week, I asked you both to do some background research on Wells, which we're going to discuss now. Gitanjali, tell us about H. G. Wells. Right. So. H. G. Wells was a hugely successful British science fiction writer. Writing at the end of the 19th and the start of the 20th century, and much of his work focused on predicting the future. Jason, do you think Wells was just using the future as a narrative device in his fiction? No, no. He really believed we can predict the future. In fact, he gave a speech at the Royal Institution in London in 1902. Called the discovery of the future, and the point he was making was that by looking at what you know about the present and about science, it's quite possible to predict the future. Indeed, Gitanjali, do you think Wells was always optimistic in his predictions? Not at all. In fact, he varied in his predictions from being extremely pessimistic about the future to being optimistic. Interestingly. One theory I read links the attitude in Wells's work to his own health. When he was writing *The Time Machine*, which was published in 1895, he'd just been diagnosed with an incurable fatal disease. Not surprisingly, the book is very pessimistic, being about a dystopia in the future, a long time in the future, the year 802-701, in fact. Where there are two races on Earth, the Morlocks and the Eloa, and the Morlocks actually eat the Eloa. I thought it was interesting, though, that it was H. G. Wells who actually came up with the phrase "time machine." So, despite being pessimistic, the work has had a lasting effect on our culture. Right. After the time machine, though, H. G. Wells didn't die, of course. And his recovery might be why he began to be a bit more optimistic about the future. So that brings us to his first utopia, Anticipations. Jason, tell us about that. Well, Anticipations, or to give it its full title, Anticipations of the Reaction of the Mechanical and Scientific Progress Upon Human Life and Scientific Thought, was published in 1901 and was set in the New Republic of the year 2000. Some of the things Wells predicts are fairly close to our reality today, including 24-hour news, global telecommunications, and even a European Union. We'll come back to the accuracy of Wells's predictions a little later. Gitanjali, how was Wells's work received at the time? Well, although Wells was extremely successful, not everyone respected his work or his predictions. Another well-known science fiction writer, Jules Verne, viciously attacked him for works such as *The First Man in the Moon*, which Verne argued weren't rooted in scientific fact at all. That's right. Now Wells wrote a number of other utopian visions of the future. Jason? Yes. In a modern utopia published in 1905, his vision was of a world where there's no private property. Where everyone has access to wonderful healthcare, and interestingly, where everyone's personal information is stored on cards in a central database outside Paris. Apart from the healthcare, I'm not sure everyone today would see that as a positive view of the future. Neither am I. And on a similar note, Wells strongly believed in population control and in the shape of things to come, which was published in 1933. He sees 
and supports a world where the population is kept at 2 billion. Once again, I'm not sure most people today would necessarily see that as a good thing. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Gitanjali, in your research, did you come across anything about the world brain? Yes, I did. It's actually very interesting. Throughout the 1930s, Wells predicted and supported the setting up of a huge world encyclopedia. And towards the end of the decade, in 1938, he wrote a series of essays called World Brain. In these essays, he called for the world to make use of modern technology to create an enormous global encyclopedia so that all our knowledge is available to all people, not just an educated elite. Wells envisioned this as probably being on microfilm. He thought it would allow anyone, anywhere in the world, to look at any book or any document. He also thought it would be created by everyone, once again, not just by an elite. Yes, and as you can imagine, many people today say that the internet has basically fulfilled his prediction. Of course, it doesn't use microfilm, but essentially, it does meet all Wells's main requirements. Unit 4. Listening B. Ask most people what the world's largest desert is, and the chances are they'll say the Sahara. The Sahara is certainly big, covering more than 9 million square kilometres. But it isn't actually the world's biggest desert. That distinction goes, strangely enough, to Antarctica, because to scientists, a desert is an area with very little or no atmospheric water vapour, and that can, of course, include very cold places. The Sahara is, though, the world's biggest hot desert. Just to give you an idea of its size, it's bigger than the whole of Australia, which is just under 8 million square kilometres in total, and almost as big as the continental United States. The region is not completely inhospitable, though. Today, about 2.5 million people live in the Sahara region, the majority of these in Egypt, Morocco and Algeria. Unit 4. Listening C. When we think of the Sahara, we tend to think of sand dunes, and some of them are extremely large, sometimes reaching 180 metres in height. It isn't all sand, though. The Nile Valley, with its lush vegetation, runs through the Sahara, and olive trees and other Mediterranean plants can be found in the northern highlands. By the way, if you ask people what they think Sahara means in Arabic, they often guess something like sand or heat. In fact, Sahara is actually the Arabic word for desert, so to call it the Sahara Desert is actually to call it the Desert Desert. Maybe that is quite apt, though, as parts of the Sahara, because of the sand and heat, are indeed extremely inhospitable. Unit 4. Listening E. The Sahara has changed considerably over the last 15,000 years or so. In the last ice age, which ended around 10,000 years ago, much of the Sahara was roughly as dry as it is now. In the more northern regions, though, there were massive ice sheets. The region was certainly inhospitable back then and was bigger, extending further to the south than it does today. Once the ice age came to an end, the climate changed. The ice in the north melted, producing some wetlands, and then the region began to dry out. However, there were soon monsoon rains throughout the region, meaning that the Sahara at this point, and for several thousand years, in fact, was considerably wetter than it is these days. 
This lasted until about 3,400 BC, by which time the monsoon had retreated south again and the process of desertification, where the desert spreads, began again in earnest. Climate-wise, not much has changed in the Sahara for the last 5,000 years. The driest parts receive less than 2 centimetres of rainfall a year. In the wettest regions, this increases to a maximum of 10 centimetres each year. One change that is being witnessed today, the desert is getting bigger, expanding to the south by as much as 50 kilometres every year. Unit 4. Speaking A. 1. Oh yes, I definitely prefer city life to life in the country. 2. I've been a student in Australia for two years now, and I prefer sharing a flat with other people to living on my own. 3. I definitely prefer not to commute so far to work each day. 4. Well, I'd rather my little brother didn't make so much noise. 5. Yes, I'd rather my grandparents had lived a bit closer to us. Unit 4. Pronunciation 1. It took ages to climb to the top of the hill. 2. I doubt it'll snow tonight. 3. There aren't any good beaches round here to my knowledge. 4. Have you ever lived in a foreign country? Unit 4. Exam Practice. Listening. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about the ozone layer and CFCs. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 7. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Today, it is well known that CFCs, or chlorofluorocarbons, can do immense damage to the ozone layer, which protects the Earth from harmful radiation from the sun. However, it was as recently as the mid-1970s when the connection between CFCs and ozone layer destruction was first established. The story starts back in 1957, when James Lovelock invented the electron capture detector. This is a machine that can detect very small amounts of a chemical compound in the atmosphere. Indeed, using the machine, it was Lovelock who was the first person to detect the widespread presence of CFCs in the Earth's atmosphere. In 1973, Lovelock, on a research trip which he'd funded himself, measured the amount of CFCs in the atmosphere in the Arctic and in Antarctica, but unfortunately came to the wrong conclusion that CFCs are not harmful to the environment. Following on from this work, though, in 1974, Sherry Rowland and Mario Molina published the very first scientific paper on the connection between CFCs and ozone depletion. This quickly prompted the world's first ban on the use of CFCs which was enacted in 1975 by the US state of Oregon. Further bans followed. In 1978, the United States and several European countries banned the use of CFCs in spray cans. CFCs were still allowed to be used, though, for refrigeration and in solvents. It was in the mid-1980s that scientists in Antarctica observed a huge depletion in the ozone layer above them often called the hole in the ozone layer. This led, in 1987, to the signing of the Montreal Protocol, which called for further reductions in the production and use of CFCs, and then, two years later, to a European Union agreement to ban the production of all CFCs by the end of the century.
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 8 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 8 to 10. So why exactly are CFCs so harmful? One of the reasons CFCs were so popular in the production of solvents and refrigeration coolants is that they are unreactive. That is, they don't react easily or at all with other chemical compounds. It's this property, however, that also makes them dangerous. Because they are unreactive, it's very difficult for them to be broken down. This gives them a long lifespan, more than 100 years in some cases, and allows them to rise into the upper levels of the atmosphere, the stratosphere, unchanged. There, ultraviolet radiation from the sun starts to break them down, freeing the chlorine atoms from the CFCs. It's this chlorine that helps destroy the ozone there. End of CD1